and welcome to Ipsy Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Guy Hamilton Smith, the legal fellow with the Sex Offense Litigation and Policy Resource Center at the Mitchell Hamlin School of Law. With me today is Mr. David Garlock. He is the program director of New Person Ministries, co chair of the Lancaster County Reentry Commission, and also a 2019 Just Leadership Fellow. David, welcome to Ipsy Dixit. Well, thank you for having me, Guy, and it's definitely an honor to be here, and I look forward to our conversation. Absolutely. Um, so I, I've, been, I've been interested in interviewing you for, uh, for a while now because you have, um, you know, we met, of course, through Just Leadership, um, and you have, I think, one of the most interesting and compelling um, stories um, around. And in thinking about how to talk about it, um, and to people who sort of don't know um, the journey that you've been on, I, I guess maybe the good place to start is um, what do you do? What, what's your job now? What, what do you do for? What do you do for a living? Well, I'm, uh, the, my full time job is I'm the program director of New Person Ministries, which is a Christian reentry home in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I actually obtained this position two days after I graduated from college, which I went to Eastern University where Brian Stevenson was an alum. And the position is an amazing opportunity. I work with uh, men that are coming out of either the county prison, state prison, or or the federal prison. And 95% of these individuals have committed sex offenses. And so you work with a population primarily that's re-entering society, um, people who have been convicted of sex offenses and have to comply with, like, not only um, registration requirements, but also, you know, like, they're on supervision, right? So probation, parole, that sort of thing. Yes, most of the <clears throat> individuals that we deal with are on parole or probation. Um, some of the individuals... Um, have maxed out their sentences and they have probation tills. Like I have one resident who maxed out his four-year sentence, but he has a 12-year probation till following his state sentence. And so it's really just an opportunity to work with these men and just help them transition, um, give them a place to stay because we're one of four houses in Pennsylvania that will house people who have committed sex offenses. And even though there are four places that will house individuals, it only adds up to 37 beds at one time. Only 37 beds at one time. So that's only like space for 37 people who are in that particular situation that um, where they can have a place to stay. Absolutely. And this is a, a population that uh, they have so much difficulty in finding home plans because a lot of times they can't go home to their family members because if their wife or if it's a female that committed it, their husband, they could potentially have kids. And that's a criteria where they can't go back to. And then sometimes you have the housing restrictions where if the individual's house is too close to a church or too close to a school or a park, and so there's all these different um, dilemmas that cause them not to be able to obtain housing. So our program is a way where they're able to come out and come into our program, and we help that transition. And typically, uh, uh, individuals in our program for three to four months, and then during that time, we help them with employment, and then we help them transition into a more permanent housing. And what's your what's your do you have like a success rate? Like how many people that you work with like go on to then, you know, I guess successfully reintegrate into into their community? Well, our program has been around for 15 years. We've had over 620 people in our program and only 90 people have gone back to prison. And that's just on technical violations or any type of offense like mm -hmm. that. We've only had three people in that period who have committed another sex offense and only one of those has a hands-on victim. Even though we know that anybody that commits a sex offense, that there is a victim, but in this case, there was only one person that actually had a hands-on mm -hmm. victim. 
And how, how long how long have you been doing this this particular work now? Well, I started working at New Person Ministries in May of 2017, so it's coming up on three years I've been in this role. And you have a, um, uh, I know that you've told you've told me the story about how you uh, got in when you realize when you learned that you were going to be interviewing for this position, and uh, I just think it's I just think it's really striking in a way to um, kind of. Uh, you know, explore a bit more of your story. So would you mind just talking about that? Absolutely. And so my wife actually found this position while I was still at school. And so I applied for it. And there was a Thursday afternoon, I was driving to Philly because my wife and I live outside of Philly. And I was actually on the way to go see my parole officer because I'm on parole. Uh, My brother and I have uh, committed a murder charge. And so while I'm on the road to see my parole officer, I get a call from the executive director, Jordan Kaufman. Now in this conversation, I share my story with him. And my story is my brother and I were sexually and physically abused for eight years. And we made an irrational decision to take the individual's life. And we received 25 years and I served 13 and a half years. So in telling the story to Jordan, afterwards, he asked me, he's like, David, the men that we work with are individuals who have committed sex offenses. Would you be able to work with this population? And I didn't hesitate. And I said, yes, I'd be able to work with this population because the the thought process is I I am definitely a man of faith and, and I have been forgiven by God, and so how could I not look at these men as people who have been forgiven by God themselves? And the name of the the ministry is called New Person Ministries, and it comes from 2 Corinthians 5, 17 that says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away, and all things have become new. And I just reiterated the fact that I would not look at these men differently, and Brian Stevenson, who has worked with my brother and me, one of his famous quotes is, you're not as bad as the worst thing you've ever done. And that's how I look at the men that I work with. Mm. And so and so you said that you, you interviewed for this position while you're on parole for, for, uh, for murder, and that you and your brother had taken the life of the person that had physically and sexually abused you and your brother as, as children. Is that, is that right? Absolutely. And the, the thing that always baffles people is they always ask me, they're like, David, you were somebody that was sexually and physically abused. How in the world can you work with somebody that has committed the same thing? And I always talk to them that it's about grace. It's about mercy. And it's about looking at them, knowing that their past does not define them. And really, when I talk to people, that's the thing where no one will ever hear me call the men I work with a sex offender. Because there's something powerful about labels and about stereotypes. And so I always refer to the men I work with as men who have committed sex offenses. And it's something that I try to instill with them, too, because a lot of times they label themselves as a sex offender. And I look at them. I'm like, what did you just say? They're like, I'm a sex offender. I'm like, what did you just say? And they're like, oh, okay, I'm somebody that committed a sex offense. And it's important for them to begin to believe that about themselves because there's power in words. Absolutely, and I mean, I know that we've had conversations before where I've you've used um, a really, I, I think, uh, critical example of that um, that I <laughs> that I've that I've stolen and used on on a couple occasions. But it's like if um, referring to someone as a thief who you know has stolen something at one point in their life and always calling them a thief or. Um, and I know that, you know, you obviously, um, deal with that in a different context, right? Because I mean, you were convicted of a homicide offense. So that people then just want to say, well, you're a murderer. 
Um, I mean, is that something, do you, do you, do you find that, um, I mean, that's something that people, I guess, who are outside of the criminal legal system, like that's something that they, uh, that they engage in pretty, pretty consistently. And I mean, do you approach them about that? And what, what, what's your reception to trying to, um, I guess, in, interrogate that impulse in people? Well, I mean, it's definitely, it, it has definitely been good as far as the conversations I've had with people. Um, one thing that I do in my role is I try to find employers who will work with my men. And so one thing I will do is I'll go to a job fair and I'll go up and I'll just blatantly tell the folks that I, I work for a reentry organization and I work with people who have committed sex offenses. Will you hire the men I work with? If they say yes, I will set up a meeting with them and I go in there. And one of the main things I do is I go in to educate them. I talk to them about the statistics as far as people who commit sex offenses and the, the recidivism rate of them. But then I go into this conversation that we're having right now about language, about people first language. And their eyes get so big when I talk to them and they talk about they've never really focused or thought about the importance of language and the importance of labeling somebody. So it's definitely been very, it's been received very well. And these conversations have led to these companies being willing to hire our men. So I think it's really important about education. And like you said, when I go into universities, I use this all the time. I have everybody raise their hand and I start calling them thieves. You, you, know? you mean if like you have and people raise just, their hand if they've ever stolen something? Yeah, if they've ever, I, I ask everybody in their class if they've ever stolen anything in their life, if it was a, a cookie out of the cookie jar or just anything. And 95% of the people raise their hand. And it's really the first two people that I start calling thieves that I have the biggest reaction out of. But then throughout the thing, when I'm walking around and I'm calling them thieves, there's so many people that don't want to look at me. They look away and they don't want that eye contact. So that's telling me that they don't want to be labeled by this thing that they might have done 10 or 15 years ago. And so I tell him that's the same thing with me. My murder happened back in 1999. So why would I want to be defined by one act that happened 20 years mm -hmm. ago? And so you said that you spent, was it 13 and a half years in, in prison? Uh, yes, sir. And uh, it was down in Alabama. Don't call me, don't call me sir. <laughs> I, I'm already, I already feel old enough. Guy, guy is totally fine. Uh, so 13 and a half years in Alabama, I mean, what was, uh, and I, I've, you know, uh, I've, I've, of course, I've of course heard some, um, you know, that Alabama as a pretty rough correctional, uh, institution, um, you know, can you talk a little bit about what your experiences were, um, and sort of your, you know, growth and development, um, while you were incarcerated? Um, Alabama is definitely has one of the, the worst, uh, prison systems there are. It has gotten a lot worse since I've been out with the amount of, uh, murders and riots and different things that have been going on the past couple of years. And even really the, the whole parole probation situation has gotten worse now especially in the past couple months when they've had this new um, individual that has taken over the parole board and they're not granting parole to anybody that has violent offenses. But that's another story. Um, as far as doing time in prison in Alabama, it, it's definitely different than potentially other states, um, especially when you look at some of the maximum security prisons. I did two years at St. Clair Correctional Facility. The one thing about maximum security prisons in Alabama is whenever there were stabbings or fights or anything, they'd lock down the camp just to find out what happened, who happened, clean up the blood, and then they'd open up the prison back up because 
this was normal. This is what happened. And it was definitely a, a situation where you always had to be on guard and watching your back. Um, everybody talks about how the contraband and other things are coming in through visitation, but that's not even true. I mean, the stuff that's coming in is coming through the officers. And there were some officers in Alabama who would get busted with drugs or cell phones, and they'd offer them the ability to resign. And six months to a year later, they could come back and mm. get another job. And um, you had mentioned um, your education. I mean, did you start um, did you start college while you were incarcerated, or how did how did all that come about? Well, um, in the county jail, I was able to take a GED program. Um, we in the Walker County Jail, we actually, my brother and I, were in the first class of people taking their GED. There were eleven of us that went through the program and actually took the test in two thousand, and ten of us passed with our GEDs. Um, when I got to prison um, in Alabama, most of your medium and maximum security prisons offer trade schools. So I enrolled in a trade and so I was able to get a drafting certificate. And these trades were through the local community colleges. During this time, mm -hmm. there was also a theology class offered from an unaccredited um, Christian college in Georgia. So mm -hmm. I was also enrolled in that. So I was able to get a master's of theology in that. So my whole thought process was that I was going to better myself. I was going to take advantage of this time. And everything I was doing was going to prepare me to be a better individual than mm -hmm. when I first got locked up. And you had mentioned that uh, you had worked with um, Brian Stevenson. You want to talk about talk about that? Yeah. So, um, uh, uh, individual that I was doing time with at Kilby introduced me to him, and so he started working with my brother and me, uh, him and Equal Justice Initiative. And uh, probably the first or second visit, they were telling us that they really couldn't help us as far as appeal or anything, but that they wanted to help us as far as our making parole, and then also having a plan for us to get out and go through their reentry program. And so <clears throat> through this process, probably the third visit I had with Brian, he knew that I wanted to further my education when I got out. And so he started telling me about Eastern University, which is a Christian college up in outside of Philly, where he actually graduated, got uh, did his undergrad work at. And so when I heard about that, I was pretty excited. And then I got the pamphlet and saw that they had a prison ministry and a street ministry. And that pretty much solidified the fact that I wanted to go up to Eastern when I was able to make parole. And so they continued to work with me in April 1st, 2013. I had made parole and got out of prison. And uh, and what's... Um... And what's happened with uh, with your brother? Uh, my brother is doing well. He's down in Louisiana. He actually got out a bit before I did. Um, he's him and his fiance. They just had a daughter about eight months ago. Um, they are engaged. He's working at a place called Honey Baked Ham, where he's the manager, and he's work, been working at the same place for over eight years. And so he's definitely thriving and, and doing everything he can. And he actually was able to get a part in a couple, uh, about a year and a half ago. So I'm actually in the process of working on getting a part in too. Amazing. And, and this wasn't the, uh, you know, once you got out, that was, and, you know, and went to Eastern, that wasn't the, the end of your, uh, of your working with Brian Stevenson. So I was wondering if um, you might be able to talk about that too. Yeah, I mean, one thing about Brian Stevenson and is that once EJI and he start working with you. It's not like once you get out of prison or once you finish their their reentry program that they just cast you off and they discard you. 
Um, he is the type of person that when you become a client, you become part of his family. And we're all, everybody who he has worked with, we are all extended family to him. And he stays connected with us and involved in what we're doing. And I mean, he is the reason that I'm involved with criminal justice reform now because of the work that he's done and his passion and always talking about being proximate. Uh, always talking about changing the narrative, always talking about that we have to do the hard thing is things that cause me to say, okay, let me get involved in this. I have that lived experience. Let me go ahead, take my experience and bring it into the field and provide empathy to other men and women as they reenter society. And uh, I mean, and so, I mean, Brian Stevenson, he's got a, you know, a movie coming out tomorrow, right? Just, just mercy. It's the same title as the book. Um, so have you, and you've, you've already, but you've already seen it, right? Yes, sir. I've already seen it three times and I know I called no. you, sir. Again. No, no, I'm from, no, that, I'm from no, that, no, we no, do that. No, that's fine. I was actually, I was actually laughing at, at, at seeing it, at seeing it three times just because I mean, from what I've heard, it's, it's excellent. And uh, I'm just so, uh, I, I guess I'm just, I'm so stoked because I already know what you're going to say. I already know what you're going to say. And I'm just, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm pretty excited and thrilled, but anyway, anyway, go on. So, so one thing that I've always wanted to do is I've wanted to do a, a speaking engagement with Brian, because once I've started doing public speaking and going into universities, it's something that I love doing. I love sharing. I love talking to and so one thing I've wanted to do is do an event with him. And so I get a text in August of 2018 from Brian, like, hey, I got this wonderful opportunity. I want to talk to you about it. So I'm thinking it's going to be an opportunity to work together as far as a speaking engagement. So he calls me in August of 2018 and we start talking. He's like, hey, do you want to be in a movie? I'm thinking, do you even have to ask somebody if they want to be in a movie? That's just like, sign me up, you know, just like put my name down. And so he told us that there were four individuals in the movie who were, in essence, unnamed clients of his. And he didn't want any actor to play those roles. He wanted four of his clients who have that lived experience as far as being incarcerated to play these roles. And all four of us have lines, but they weren't scripted lines. So each one of us sat in front of the camera for about 18 to 20 minutes, and we got a chance to share our story. So the lines that you hear of us in the movie are actually things that actually happened to us. And that goes to show the type of person that Brian Steven is, Stevenson is, is that he didn't want just actors to play these roles. He wanted his clients to share their own personal stories and have that closeness and that interaction with the audience. And I think that's something that is very powerful about the movie. Absolutely. And I mean, I can't, <clears throat> I can't wait to see it. Um, and, uh, and, and it comes out and just uh, for everyone's edification, it comes out tomorrow, right? Yeah, it comes out January 10th uh, in the U.S. Uh, I think the 17th in 2000, I mean, and then the 24th in other countries, you know, but yes, it comes out. I think some theaters are actually starting a screening tonight at midnight, so. Okay. I hope a lot of people are waiting till midnight <laughs> tonight to see this because it's a powerful movie. Everyone needs to go well, out and David, see. David, uh, my friend, uh, I couldn't be couldn't be happier for you, and um, I'm I'm excited to see the movie. And uh, thank you so much for for coming on and sharing with us some of your story. Absolutely, I, I am definitely thankful for the opportunity. And I mean, we both know that there's power in our story, you know, and being able to share, being able to encourage others, and just being able to walk with people who have those same experiences is powerful. And that's one thing I will do until I take my last breath. I couldn't have said it better myself. David, thanks again so much. Absolutely.
Of the 